Today I'm going to take you through the whole process of getting your NFT collection on the Solana network. My name is Daniel aka Hashlabs and welcome to the channel where I teach you how to code and we talk about everything blockchain related. Now, if you get stuck in any part of this tutorial series, please go ahead and go to hashtips.online and then join our Discord or Telegram channels. The community is very friendly and there's always people eager to help out if you are stuck. Next, in this video we will be for the first part looking at the Hashlips Art Engine. If you haven't dealt with the Hashlips Art Engine yet and want to know how to generate thousands of NFT artworks, Go to the playlist on my channel and look through the playlist over here. This is create 10,000 artworks using that engine and it will give you a good oversight on how to use the program. Keep in mind each iteration or each video we add to the code and there are updates so watch all of the videos. That being said let's jump in and look at how we can start our Solana NFT collection. A little bit about Solana, it's a blockchain, it's very fast and scalable. This makes it a great contender for NFTs, especially if you go down here and see the live transactions taking place and the very appealing transaction cost which is super low. That's why people have been publishing their NFTs and selling their NFTs on Solana. Now the problem is, how do we get our generated NFTs and metadata onto the Solana blockchain? Well, that's what we're going to find out today. Solana works a little bit differently to Ethereum. Where Ethereum has smart contracts, Solana has something called programs. The two are also written in two different programming languages. Luckily, there are companies out there or um, protocols that's been written right on Solana that makes it easier for us to simply use their code base and interact with the program and deploy our NFT using their protocol. And that's the protocol that we'll be looking at. So even though we are deploying now on Solana, we'll be spending most of our time in something called Metaplex. Now these are the Metaplex docs and let's talk about what Metaplex even is. So now that we understand that Solana is going to be the underlying blockchain that we are deploying our NFTs on, we need some kind of tool set, some program to help us upload our NFTs onto the blockchain and create the link between the NFTs and a minting kind of uh, dApp, right, for the users to mint. And that's where Metaplex comes in. Metaplex is built on top of Solana and is its own kind of set of tools and smart contracts to help us achieve uploading the images and metadata and then creating that link so that we can use it in a front-end dApp for users to mint your NFTs. Solana by itself, if you just write smart, well, not smart contracts, but programs on it, you have to know Rust and you need to dive deep into code, which we'll get to on a later tutorial. For now, just understand that Metaplex is a set of tools that's available for us to use to make this process of uploading NFTs easier onto the Solana network. The tools that we are going to be using from Metaplex is basically the candy machine. So Metaplex provides us a way to create your own store such as OpenSea but just on Solana and create the candy machine that they call it which I think it's a very cool name because it's almost like a candy machine. You put a bunch of stuff in there and if you turn the knob then a candy falls out, right? Um, that's what I imagine it to be. But uh, anyway, Candy Machine is actually the small, uh, a small library that they have for you to use to create that linkage to upload your NFT data to the network and to create that link giving us some IDs that we can use in a minting dApp which we can look at another repo later on in this tutorial. But Candy Machine is the crucial part that we need to upload the NFTs. To get you used to the Solana ecosystem, explorer.solana.com is a place that you can go to to see transactions, look at what's happening on the blockchain itself. It's very similar to the etherscan.io for the Ethereum blockchain. Each blockchain has some sort of website like this 
where you can look up transactions and what's happening on the blockchain. This explore.solana.com is great, but there's a better one that I feel is much more intuitive and if you scan your wallet, you will also be able to see your NFTs on it. So this one is called solscan.io, which is pretty cool. The next thing that I want you to note is in your extensions, usually you'll use MetaMask for the Ethereum network, but this time you need to download Phantom. The Phantom wallet is very similar to MetaMask, but Phantom is used for Solana. So go ahead and download Phantom, log in and follow the process so that you can get your first wallet address listed on your Phantom wallet and then make sure you save all the uh, private keys uh, somewhere safe. So once you have your Phantom wallet installed and everything is ready to go, you can fund it with some Sol from an exchange. There's a lot of videos on how to do that. The most important concept I want you to grasp is if you go to the settings tab over here and you scroll down, you can switch the network to the DevNet. Currently, I'm on the main network. If I switch to the DevNet, I will see if I go back to my uh, funds, I can go to the top here and you can see my main account doesn't have anything because it's now pointing to the developer network. I do, however, have a test uh, account that I've set up, a test wallet and funded it with some test sol. And um, I also then gone ahead and complete the process of uploading an NFT. Now, this is where you can view your NFTs. And like I said, this is now on the DevNet. But please understand that in this video, we'll be talking about the mainnet and the DevNet. So everything we'll be doing, will be doing on the DevNet. But once you're ready, you can switch to the mainnet and do everything exactly the same, but this time with real soul, real money, and deploying it on the real main network. That being said, don't worry about not having a test account yet. We will create one on your local machine, which we are going to fund with some test soul, and then you can import it into your wallet. I'll show you how to do that in this tutorial. For now, just sit back, relax, and enjoy this tutorial. We're now going to look at the dependencies you'll need to have to follow along. For the prerequisites, make sure that you have node.js installed. You can go to node.js.org and install it for your platform. Next, you also want to make sure that you have some sort of code editor IDE available that makes it easy for us to work with the code. This is Visual Studio Code and I highly recommend it. It's free and it's a wonderful tool. You can go ahead and install this on your machine. Just follow the steps. This is where the whole journey starts. You can go to getup.com forward slash hashlips forward slash hashlips underscore art underscore engine. This is the whole program that everyone has been using to generate NFTs. Now, you'll see when you land on this page, on the right hand side, there's releases. And if you click on releases, you can see all the different releases that's been happening with this program. Currently, we are looking at version 1.0.8, which has the Solana metadata update. So what I want you to do is when you're on the releases page, go and download the source code.zip file on your desktop and extract it. The next program that you're going to need is Metaplex. Remember the tool set that we talked about? So go to this GitHub repo, Metaplex-Foundation-Metaplex. And then once you're on this page, you can click on this green button code over here and also download the zip. I want to download all the prerequisite programs and have it stored in one location so it's easy for us to switch between them. The last piece of the puzzle that we'll need is the exiled ape dash candy dash machine dash mint. Now this repo is not totally necessary because this is simply a web page where we hook up all the configurations and then it interacts with the minting dApp uh, to the blockchain and then it mints the NFTs. So what I'm basically saying is this part you can swap out for any other UI and we're going to see how we can change the UI, but it's very convenient to use this repo. So I would suggest go ahead and use it and then change up the CSS, the styling, so that you know everything will work perfectly. We can go ahead and click on the code button and then click on download zip. I want you to put all this on your desktop in a folder and then we're going to extract all three of these repos. 
Now that we have the three main parts that we need, you can go and unzip each file. I've placed all these fo uh, folders inside one directory. It's very important to keep your code neat and your project neat as you work with it. So I can go ahead and delete those zip files after extracting each folder and we're ready to go. Now, keeping in mind, we're going to start off with the Hashlips Art Engine first. If you want to know more about the Hashlips Art Engine and how it works, how you can build out very complex NFT structures, go ahead and watch that playlist that I showed off in the beginning of this video. Now, all we're going to use the Hashlips Art Engine for in this series is using the base NFTs that we get along with it and generate the Solana metadata so that it can work on the Solana blockchain. Let's go ahead and look at what we need to do next. The next step that you want to do is actually open Visual Studio Code, go and say File, Open, and locate the folder that we have now created. I've placed everything underneath a folder called Solana, and in there, the first folder we need to basically go and do stuff in is the Hashlips Art Engine. So let's go in there and let's just say Open. Once we've done this, we get to the Hashlips Art Engine program. Now, we usually follow the same steps over and over. We go to Terminal, say New Terminal, then we run npm install. Once the installation is complete, we can then run the commands allocated here on the package.json file. And these are these ones, build, generate, rarity, preview, pixelate, and update info. Each one is explained in the previous videos that I've made in that playlist, but go ahead and explore them for yourself. What's most important here is that our layers, over here you can see on the layers folder, we've got our backgrounds, bottom lids, and they all are different layers for the NFT that I'm going to generate. It's very important that the spelling of these layers and files are correct, how you want it to appear on your metadata. Once we have our layers configured and you have all your images and layers imported, you can open the source file inside config. And then in here, just make sure that your layer spelling over there, background, um, bottom lid, eye color is the same that it's spelled over here. You can add extra options to change that name. And that's also explained in the version 1.0.7. But the latest changes in version 1.0.8 is the real Solana change. Let's walk through the changes that's been made and how we can utilize exporting Solana metadata as well as the images. I'm going to generate my images with the Ethereum network in mind, as you would if you do this for Ethereum. I need to make sure, and by default it's set to ETH, that on line 9 over here, that the network is ETH. The other option is .sol. We'll get to that in a second. Making sure that this is now the network Ethereum, it will not include this metadata for Solana, but it will include the general metadata over here. So you still need to change these. Then in the terminal below, I can run npm run generate like so. Once I do that, a new build folder will be created and inside there, the images as well as the metadata will now be created for me. I can see that if I scroll down, that five images will be created. Please note that you see here in the terminal that it started from one all the way to five. Now, when it comes to Solana, it's going to generate from zero to four if you specified five NFTs. Keep that in mind. But for now, because this is Ethereum, we can open the build folder and look at the images, which looks pretty cool. And in the JSON file, we have their respective JSON uh, files for each image. This looks pretty familiar and it's because it's exactly the same as how it was for Ethereum. Let's say we want to generate Solana metadata. To make it clear, you can use this program to generate Ethereum metadata and Solana metadata. But how do we generate the Solana part now? Well, what we can do is let's quickly briefly take a look on the Metaplex documentation for 
the metadata standard when it comes to Solana. You will see that the metadata looks very similar to Ethereum. We also have name, description, uh, image and all these things. But most of this data gets compiled and altered with Metaplex as soon as it uploads to the cloud and to the decentralized storage. So I'll explain that when it comes to this. But there are a few extra fields such as sellers fee uh, basis points and so on. So that's something you need to take in consideration when working with Solana. Luckily, the program that I'm showing you now generates this for you and you only have to change a few attributes. Let's jump back to the program and let me discuss the thing that you need to change when working with Solana. So the first thing you need to do to generate Solana metadata is change this line on number nine to instead of saying network.eth, network.sol in small letters like so. This will tell the Hashlips art engine that you are about to generate metadata for Solana and it will take this in consideration. Let's quickly walk through the variables that you need to alter. Keep in mind this section over here is cross-platform, it's generic, it will show up on Ethereum and Solana. So please remember to change your name that prefixes the hashtag for your NFT. So what you can do is here you specify a name of the collection. You can also leave it empty if you want to. Um, I've made it Nerdy Coder Clones, but let's call it, uh, I'm going to work with the sheep, the sheep gang club. I don't know. <laughs> uh, sheep gang club. Okay. Then next, replace your description to what you want. And when it comes to Solana, the base URI is not important. When, when you're working with Ethereum, it is, but not in Solana's case. So leave this just as it is. Next, because we have a symbol, don't make this more than five or six characters. Keep it short and nice. Because my collection's name is Sheep Gang Club, I'm going to call this SGC. Then it comes to the seller's fee basis points. Now, what this basically is, it it. it refers to the secondary sales, what you'll get, and you can get up to 10% of secondary sales or, or even more, I think, I'm not sure. But at this point, keep it under 10 because you don't really want to take the whole pie. <laughs> um, but basically, you specify it in points. Instead of saying a percentage, a uh, thousand points will be 10%. So if you want to specify that you want 2.5% of a secondary sale on a NFT, you would say this should be 250. Then you get the external link. You can change this to point to your collections website or whatever it might be. Then you get to the creators section. You can see that creators lives in an array and I've got one creator in here. Keep in mind that the shares distributed between these creators needs to add up to a hundred. So if I, for instance, had a new creator in here, and I wanted to say we're going to split the fee 50-50. This will be the secondary sales. What you'll do is you'll specify it like this, splitting this up to still make 100. You can add a lot more if you want to and just remember to change the address. This now needs to be a sole address, a Solana address. But anyway, I'm going to keep it simple and maybe just have one in there. You also don't have to specify in there if you don't specify this parameter, but I'm going to keep one address in there at least. And that's about it that you need to change. So remember to change this to .sol and to update your metadata over here. When you run the program again by typing in npm run generate, and I can just do that and hit enter, you'll see that it regenerates the collection and the build file is emptied and created again. And this time you can see it starts from zero. That's very important in the Solana space. So even though I've specified that I wanted five NFTs, it's going to generate from zero to four, still making it five, but it's just zero indexed. If we look at the JSON metadata now, you can see that we've got pretty similar metadata to what Solana expects. 
and we can verify that by going to the website and just seeing how it looks over here. And that's how simple it is to basically generate a collection from layers. Like I said, if you want to see the full layer generation part, please go and watch that uh, tutorial series on, the, on this Hashlips art engine. But this is how simple you can just swap out for Solana uh, metadata. To show you how easy it is to swap back, you can just go to the config.js file and remember to save the config.js before you run the commands. You can go in there and say .eth again. And then once you've set that, you can go into the terminal, run, it, run the command, and you see it generates Ethereum metadata again. So we're going to keep it to .sol for now. I'm going to hit save and I'm going to have it run. Now that you have your collection ready, and let's say you made thousands, right? You can increase this uh, number over here to a thousand NFTs. Um, maybe I'm going to make a bit more than five, so I'll make 10. So I'm going to just generate 10. And there we go. Uh, it's from zero to nine. And you can see there's my images zero to nine. It's a good practice to at this point, just select a random one and check the corresponding metadata. So number seven has a purplish blue eye and if I click on this metadata you can see that the eye color is purple. It's good to batch check just uh, some of the metadata. Perfect. Now that we have this our first section is done and now we can open Metaplex. Just on a side note I want to make sure that you understand that this creators array seeing that I took an address away needs to be a hundred again. I took one away and I left it at 50. But you need to make sure that this whole array, how many addresses you add in there, it all adds up correctly to 100% basically. So that being said, after you have made sure that this all adds up to that 100 share, then you can run it again and you'll be sure that your collection will be successful. Now that we're done with the very first step and that is creating the art and the metadata, Let's go ahead and create a new folder. I'm going to call this folder assets like so. And then I'm going to open up the Ashlips art engine and go into the build folder and open up my images. I'm going to drag all my images up to that very top level assets as well as all the JSON files. I'm going to leave out the underscore metadata.json. Once it's all in assets, I can close off my art engine again. And let's have a look at this assets folder. You can see that it's now a mixture between metadata and the image. Now Metaplex will automatically loop through this and update your metadata accordingly to upload it to the decentralized storage. So once you have your assets folder set up like this, you can go ahead and put it directly in the Metaplex master folder. So I'm going to drag this asset all the way in there. And that's it. Now we can go ahead and open Visual Studio Code and I can say file open. And this time I'm going to go to my place where I've saved these three folders and I'm going to open the Metaplex. Once I open Metaplex, I will see that there's my assets folder with all the assets. For now, we're just going to leave it there because we need to now install the Sol, uh, Solana CLI. The Solana CLI is separate from Metaplex, but it's something that we need in our computer to actually run Solana commands and that Metaplex also uses. Let's now get a bit more technical. If you have made it this far, congratulations. I really appreciate you sticking with me in this tutorial. It means that you are a Hashlips Art Engine master. Now, just a side note, if you love this content, please leave a comment uh, on this video and a like, and I would always appreciate if you subscribe so that you don't miss out if I have any updates. Talking about updates, we are going to focus on Metaplex now. Metaplex is still under development and might change in the future. That's why following this guide, you will see the most up-to-date version of Metaplex when you follow along with their guides. And that's what we are going to do because that's the most source of truth way of doing a tutorial. 
is going to the documentation. Let's go ahead and see what I'm talking about. If you go to the documentation, you'll see that Metaplex uh, has an introduction, but what we want to focus on is the candy machine part. So if you click on candy machine, the tab, click on introduction, this is where our journey will start to upload our collection. Looking at the introduction, we can see that we need some prerequisites. So let's go ahead and click on this link over here. This link tells us we need to have this installed before we can work with Metaplex and Candy Machine. This is because we need to make sure that we have got the Solana CLI installed, which is separate, but um, Candy Machine and Metaplex makes use of it. So we need to install that. Now it says that you need Git installed here firstly. Well, we don't really need it because we already downloaded our GitHub repos by manually downloading the zip file. It's sometimes complex for people to understand what Git is, but it's source control. So if you understand what it is, do it that way. Otherwise, just follow along how I've done it. Next, we need Node installed and you should already have Node installed based on the previous tutorial. Then it asks us to install Yarn. Let's go and do that step. If we go to Visual Studio and we click on Terminal and on New Terminal, you would get a new terminal down here. And we can simply run npm install yarn. Now here we can say install, okay, we need to say install yarn. Now once you install yarn, yarn will be added uh, to your machine and then you can use yarn commands. Yarn is exactly the same as npm. It's just a different package manager. I prefer yarn, but most people are comfortable with node and npm. Then let's go back to the documentation and it asks us to install TS node. Now this is a TypeScript version, I believe of node, but um, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to install it. And this might work perfectly for you. In my case, it doesn't want me to install this on my machine and the reason for that it is how my paths are set up so I'm going to show you what you will do so what you need to do is if you go to the installation you can click here by the way you can follow installation files on each one of these so there you can see we can run a bunch of these commands so we can basically run this command if we want to install it globally so let's go back to Visual Studio Code and paste that. And this will use npm install. The dash G says that it's going to be global on your machine. Otherwise, you can just omit the dash G and it will install only for this package. And you can hit enter. This will now start a big download and install uh, ts-node. To check if everything is working, you can check the node version. So let's go back to the documentation first. So let's check that we have node and obviously you, you would have had node, but I'm going to show you anyway how you can check. So you can type node dash dash version. If there's a version number popping up, you've installed this correctly. We can also do this with yarn dash dash version. And there's yarn. Now we can try TS dash node, but like I said, my machine doesn't work really well with it. Um, dash dash version and there you can see it says it didn't find it now for me there's a workaround which I'm going to show you for you it might just work and you don't need this workaround the workaround is to use npx which downloads the dependency as you need it but we'll get to that on a later stage don't worry for now you can still follow along and you can just uh, run all the commands as it should if you have the same problem that I'm incurring, I'll also show you that workaround. Let's see what is the next prerequisites that we need. We've already tested our versions apart from Git because we already downloaded all the repos needed for this tutorial. So the next part, you can actually scroll uh, all the way down to where it says install the Solana command line tools. Click on that link and let's open it. Follow this link for your operating system. So if you have Mac or Linux, follow this section. And then if you have Windows, go and follow this section.
I'm going to scroll all the way to the top and follow the Mac OS because that's what I'm running. So it tells me to go and install this. So I'm going to copy that and then I'm going to go to my Visual Studio Code, click on Terminal, New Terminal, and then I'm going to paste this in here. I'm going to hit Enter. So do the same if you have Windows for the Windows machine and the Windows steps. Now this will download onto my machine the Solana CLI and this will allow me to in the terminal in these terminals to run the Solana commands and you can do a lot of cool things with this. Now it's going to ask us to update our environment uh, variables to use this path. So at this point you can even see in the documentation that they mention that you might need to update the path variable in order for you to run Solana. Now this might not be the case for you and you might be able to run Solana like that and when you hit enter Solana should work or in specific Solana dash dash version like so. You can see that it's asking me to update the path. Now I can copy this and paste it in here and it will work only for this terminal but let's do it the right way of updating it. There's a different way of updating the path for Windows so just Google that if you are struggling. But for Mac, you can copy the path all the way from there to here. Open up a new terminal and run sudo nano forward slash etc forward slash paths. Then you're going to put in your password. And once you get to this file, you want to paste your path in there. Then hit that um, symbol over there. So the uh, up arrow and X and then just Y to save it. Once you've done this, Solana is now added to your paths of your machine. The path basically points to the bin file, the execution file of Solana. So now, when I run it, it should work, but it will require that you close the terminal. So I'm going to close the terminal. So I'm just going to maybe remove all these terminals. Say so file, new terminal so that it has a refresh and then I'm going to run Solana dash dash version. Once I do that, I can see that I get the Solana version over there. And now we can continue. Now that we have the CLI installed, basically the command line tools for Solana, we have Solana on our machine. Just to give you an example, I can go to Visual Studio and type in Solana and then you can see all the commands that I can potentially run, such as transfer, getting airdrops, uh, making, setting up the configuration, looking at my accounts, the address, and so forth. This is a very nice tool how you can interact with the blockchain. I'm going to press command K to clear the terminal. Then I'm going to go back to the documentation and we can see that they want us now to set up our network. So you can see that we have to type in Solana, configure, set the URL to point to the DevNet on Solana. What is this? What basically does this mean? Well, remember our phantom wallet. Now I'm just going to type in my password here. So remember the, the phantom wallet where I said you get the DevNet and you get the testnet, right? there's the dev network and you can see that it says HTTPS API devnet.solana.com because we are testing this on the devnet we want to set the configuration of our Solana that we have on our local machine to point to this network because we don't want to do it on the main network yet but if you are going to do it on the main network you're going to set it up to point to the main network but not that one, you'll most probably do this one. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and let's go back to our tutorial and let's run this command. So copy this command all the way from there to here. Let's go and paste it in our terminal and hit enter. You can now see that the RPC URL, this one, this line over here, should now say api.devnet.solana.com and that is, we've done it correctly. So that's perfect. Let's go and do the next step. So now we need to actually create a wallet. So how do we create a wallet? Now, 
Remember you had a wallet here in Phantom, which is your main wallet and your test wallet. Now I'm going to create a new wallet and hook it up to my Phantom just for future usage. But I'm going to warn you, when you do this, this is going to show your, your private key. So please don't do this and show your private key to the whole world. I'm just doing this for testing purposes. So what you need to run next is this line over here. Solana key gen new and then the output file. And then you need to specify where do you want to output this to. So this is going to output to my configs file in my um, machine. So I'm just going to copy this and then I'm going to go down and I'm going to go to my Visual Studio. I'm going to paste that in there. But let's call this the devnet dash uh, hash lips, right? I'm just going to call my file devnet dash hash lips. So at this point, I'm going to hit enter. Now it's going to ask me for a key phrase. Now, this is kind of your password um, phrase. So just think of something. I'm going to use one, two, three, four. And there we go. So now that I've entered that, this spits out to us very crucial information. So the information here, you can see this is our seed phrase, which you should never show to anyone. Like I said, I'm just sharing this because this is a test account. At this point, it's very important for you to start saving this information. Please save this crucial information on a safe place. For now, I'm going to save everything that is um, output it right here in a file. I'm going to create a new file and just call it info. Then I'm going to copy this whole line from there to here and paste it in there. I also want to actually make sure that um, this is a secure place that I save this in. So just make sure that this is secure and you don't just save it willy nilly so that everyone can have access to it. Basically the information that's here shows where this configuration file sits. This is kind of your private key, your key pair where it sits and exists on your machine. This is a very important file and shouldn't be shared with anyone. This is also the file that you can use to connect um, your phantom wallet. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Next, this is your public key, the key that you usually see in your wallet and your phrase, like I mentioned. So just save this in the info section. I'm going to do this because I want you to um, get used to saving the command so it's easy for you to copy it on a later stage. Let's go and add this wallet to our phantom address so that we can use it on a later stage to do some mints. So I want to copy this and then open the finder. I'm going to press Control command G to paste in where this file is located and there it is. So now what I want to do with this on hand, I can actually pull it to the side and I can open my Chrome browser, go to my phantom extension and in here I want to click add and connect a wallet. Here I can say import my private key. So this is optional. I'm just going to call this test two because later on I'm going to definitely delete this. Then I want to open my um, key. I want to select everything, copy that, and then go back to Chrome. I have to do this again. So go and add the wallet, import private key, paste it in there, and I'm going to call this test two. Now I can say import, and there you can see there's a new test wallet. So that's a test wallet, and I also have this as a test wallet. You can see currently my test wallet has zero funds in it. Let's make sure that we are on the dev network so that we can see the changes reflecting immediately. We are indeed on the dev network because remember, we set the dev network over there. Now let's go ahead and go back to Visual Studio Code. We can close this now off and just make sure you save your info file. You can now see that this is exactly what we got. Now in here, we're going to set another configuration. Remember we set the uh, configuration to point to the dev network. 
Well, now we are going to point it to the key pair where we have saved it. So copy everything from Solana config set key pair and then this part we're going to change. So go back to Visual Studio at the bottom, paste that in there, Solana config key pair with a space and then copy this that you've saved in your info file and paste it there at the end. So the full command looks like that. I'm going to hit enter and then you'll see that our key pair down here has now been updated to point to this JSON. What does this now mean? Well, it means if I say uh, Solana balance, it will try and get the balance of that wallet, right? This is my pri um, public uh, key and this is my private phrase and I've now hooked it up over here. I also hooked it up to Phantom on the browser. So now my wallet is hooked up locally and it's also hooked up on the browser. Now what is next? Well, we can now airdrop a Solana or a few Solana to our wallet, but this is dev testing Solana. So let's go and do that. How you can do that is by running Solana airdrop and then you specify how much it should airdrop. I'm going to try and airdrop three Solana. So now it's saying requesting to airdrop three and there it was successful. Over there you can see three is in this wallet. So this time if I run Solana balance, I can see that that balance is three. I can also run interesting commands such as Solana address. And by doing that, I can get my public key over there again, just for in case I forgot it. Like I said, Solana has a lot of commands that you can run. But the most important thing is we airdropped three Solana to our address using the CLI. If we go to Phantom, this should also reflect over here on our test um, address. And you can see it's the same address because it's 3FFO. And if we go and check in Visual Studio, it ends with 3FFO. So if we go and open uh, Phantom again, we can see that indeed we've got three Sol. Okay, enough explaining about the CLI and what Solana does, and this is all cool. But let's get back to the Metaplex part. So in your terminal, what you can do now, make sure that you are on Metaplex in this uh, root directory. And I'm going to hit Command K to clear out the terminal. And this time I'm going to say CD JS. What does cd.js mean? You can see that now it says JS there. It means that I basically am pointing inside of this directory. So instead of me opening Visual Studio on this directory again, the terminal is simply pointing to it. So in there, I want to run yarn and install. So let's go and run yarn install. Make sure all the dependencies are installing. And then I'm going to run um, yarn bootstrap. Once this is finished, you want to run yarn build. After running yarn build, like I said, we're going to run yarn bootstrap. Let's wait for this to finish its execution. Great, it is successful. Now you can type in yarn bootstrap and run that. This will bootstrap all the files and now we're actually ready to go one folder back. So you want to type in cd dot dot and hit enter. You want to make sure that it says you're on the Metaplex uh, root file again. We don't want to be pointing in the JS because from here on out, we want to have access to our assets and we will drill down to the candy machine. Perfect. We are now at the place where we want to be. We are going to tell Metaplex to actually upload our assets now to the decentral storage and then hook it up to the candy machine so that we can create the front end app. There are three crucial commands that we need to run and they look like this. I am going to put these commands in the description of this video, but keep in mind that each one of these commands uh, prefix like this is exactly the same. What it basically means is that we are going to go into the JS, then package, then CLI, the SRC, then the candy machine, CLI.ts file. 
we want to locate this file, which is basically sitting inside JS, packages, uh, CLI, source, and there it is. But the reason why we specify it like this is because we are now on the root file. Make sure you are on the root file. Once you are, you can go ahead and run this first command. You can see that this command wants to upload a folder, which is our .assets sitting here. Then we specify the environment, which is DevNet. If you want to deploy to the mainnet, you will change these all to mainnet as well as where it's pointing to. And then you want to pass it a key pair. So what you want to do now is take your key pair up here and replace it everywhere where it says path. The second command basically does the candy machine creation. It's also on the dev environment and the key pair we're going to give it is exactly the same. So replace it. And then the last command. While now the token has been created, we want to update and say that our token needs a price that it can mint against as well as a starting date. This date can be older than today so that you can immediately start minting. But here again, I'm going to replace the path. Now that we have these three lines, you can basically go ahead and copy and paste them in your terminal. I'm just going to pause for a second so that you can actually see what you need to type out. So they look like that. Just keep in mind, replace this part with your, uh, with your um, key pair. So, and this is how it looks here at the end. So that you can type it out. Great, I hope you got that. Let's go ahead and copy the first line, paste it in our terminal and hit enter. This process is quite quick. What it will do is it will look for the two pairs while the image and the JSON file. And here you can see it tells us that it found 10 and it's going to go ahead and upload them to a decentral storage. And that's exactly what we want. You will see that as soon as this process takes place, a .cache file here on the left hand side is created. We can open this on a later stage and well, we can just click on it and look at how it uh, looks like now. But on a later stage, I'm going to show you how we can read the data from this, where we're going to need it for our DAP. For now, let's complete our three commands. So let's wait for this to be uh, to finish up and then we can run the second one. This is all successful and complete. You can see it says done and it was successful. What we want to do now is copy this link over here, the second one. So go ahead and copy that. You will probably have to get it from the description or type this out. Well, all it needs to do is it needs to create the candy machine and we're going to pass it in the ENV, which is DevNet, and then it needs a key pair. And that's basically all. So once you've copied that second line, go in your terminal and paste it and hit enter. This will go ahead and now actually create the link, the bond on the blockchain to go and create a transaction and get our candy machine minting dap um, ready, right? Because we or prepare for it for us to get it ready. Basically, it's going to kick off a transaction. So that is finished. You can see that we now have a public key. There it is. And then the last command we're going to copy as well. Basically, what this does is it updates the candy machine with information. We have to give it the key pair, which is our key pair. And this will be your key pair. Then we're going to put a price. Now this price is in Sol, so I can maybe specify this as dot four Sol or dot two Sol. And then we want to specify a date. And then this will be our date. The date has to be in this format. So just make sure it is in that format and you can set it to an older date, meaning that uh, you can actually start minting today if it's an older date. If it's a future date, it would be like a, you know, launch date. And that's basically what it is. I love my NFTs, so I'm going to make my price one sole. Anyway, let me copy this and 
Let me go and paste it here at the bottom in the terminal and let's press enter and have it update the information. I just want to show you what's basically now happening. If I go to the browser quickly, you can see that we got the soul scanner. If I open my wallet on Phantom and log in, and I go to the wallet address that I am using, remember I am using the 3FF0. And if you want to know what wallet you are using locally, you can go to your terminal. And by the way, this was successful. It said that it updated the timestamp and the starting date. You can just make sure that there's your public key. It's the 3FF0 wallet, remember. But if you also want to get your wallet again, you can run Solana and address. Then you also will get your wallet. But by the way, we can go and open that wallet on Phantom and head over to the transactions. And there you can see this is what happened. We have a successful transaction and you can actually see this transaction over here, the signature. I'm going to copy that, I'm going to paste it in the soul scan.io and search for it. And then here I can see. So I can see now that there's my go live date, there's my price, one soul, and there's everything that I need. How cool is that? Well, now we can actually go and hook up the rest of this tutorial to our DAP, basically. So all our candy machine to the DAP. Um, but before we do that, I want to show you where you can get the most important information. So if you go to this cache file in this DevNet temp, and you can see there's a long string with all this information here, you can find the place where it says config and then copy this, um, basically this hash, go to your info file and paste it here. Then just maybe make a note here at the end that it is a config. So I'm going to just give it a like so. This is my config. Then I need my second one, which if I go back to that temp dev file and I go all the way to the back, these three keys, these three properties are very important. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go here and paste it. You can see that the ones that I just copied now is basically the authority, the candy machine address and the start date. It's basically the same that I've just seen on this scanner, but it's better for me to actually go and uh, just finish the tutorial by showing how you can get this off the actual files as well. So now that we have this, I'm going to uh, copy this and just close this and copy this. Then I'm going to go to the file. I'm going to say open. And then remember where we actually had the Solana file and the candy machine that we've downloaded. Now is the time to open this. So let's go ahead and open the candy machine. You can see that this is now your candy machine template and it is a normal website. The first thing you want to do when you open this uh, repo, this folder, is run npm, or not npm, yarn install. Once you run yarn install, it will install all the dependencies, making your dApp ready to run. The next thing that you want to do is go to the .env file, the .env.example. Firstly, rename this and take off the example. So all you need there is the .env. Once you have that, you can open this file up. You can paste the contents that you just copied, or you can go and grab it again. But we need to basically replace the config and the authority and the candy machine and the start date in these parameters. So here you can see the top one requires the candy machine configuration. That is this address. So I'm going to paste that there. 
The next one is the candy machine ID. That is the candy machine address, which is this one. That one I can paste over here. Then the authority is my wallet, which I can put there. And then I need a start date, which is this timestamp. I can now go and remove this, save this file, and in the terminal, run yarn start. The yarn start command will start up your local host. Now that we have this, we can go ahead and connect to our wallet, which is phantom. Once I do that, I can see that there's my wallet, the soul in my wallet balance, the available NFTs, how many has been minted, and how many is remaining. You can see that if we go to Phantom, that we are indeed on the dev network. So let's go ahead and mint. I'm going to click on mint. It's going to pop up the transaction and let's go ahead and approve. This might take a second. And if you want to view the transaction, you can go into your wallet, go down here and click on this transaction. Here we can see that this took place just now. Like I mentioned, I have a way better experience using SoulScan. So I'm going to copy the signature, head over to SoulScan and paste it in here. Now I can see this was successful. It minted a NFT. And how cool is that? Now, technically, if I go to my wallet, you can go on Phantom. And if I go and copy my wallet address, let me just go and copy it over there. And I put it in Soul Scan. You can see there's my value and there's my SPL token balance. I've got one. So now I can actually go and click on that one. And let's look at my very new NFT. I absolutely love SoulScan for the fact that you can see everything so nicely. You can even see the metadata over here. And it's pretty cool. Well, guys, I think we have done very well up until this point. I would love for you guys to tell me in the comments if you would like me to do a video next showing you how to do this on the main network. When you come back to the DAP, you can see that there are 10 available and now there's one redeemed, which is in my wallet. If you go to your Phantom wallet now, you can click on these little blocks and then you'll see the NFT right there. I think Phantom is very cool for the fact that they display, display your NFT so nicely. We are not done yet. This dApp doesn't look at all appealing. So what we're going to do next is go through a, let's call it revamp session. What you can do now is jump back to the code base, go to the SRC folder and open the home.tsx. This is the place that I've seen in this repo where we can find the balance, total, redeemable and remaining. Keep in mind, I did not code on this repo, so I have to kind of find my way around as well. But this main uh, element here, we can give a background color. And this is usually the process I take to figure out where elements sit on the page. I give it a background color of pink. So let's do pink. And then when I go to the browser, I can see this container wraps those two elements. This is very good. So what I can do now, let's go ahead and maybe center them off the bat. When working with CSS, we get a term called flex. So if I make the display flex and then simply put the justify content to center, we will see that if I go back to the content, it's centered here. I want to kind of make this dap so that the connect button sits here on the right uh, top side and then we can have the content here in the middle. It's just a basic restructuring. Let's see how we can do that. So the easiest way is to split your kind of divs, your section with background colors so we can easily see what we are doing and how we are working with the structure. 
So let's go ahead and add a new div over here. So I'm just going to say this is going to be our new div and we need to close it. And then I'm going to make another div. This div is going to be for our top content and this one for our bottom content, the whole screen. Now, because we made this flex, we can actually now on this content div, flex it to the fullest of uh, the screen. But like I said, it's best if we put a background color on each of these. So I'm going to remove this, but then change the background color to green. And I'm just going to save it so it restructures. And then on this div, I'm going to put a blue. So nothing is in there yet. What I want to do is instead of centering the content in the middle, I'm going to take that out, but I'm going to leave it flex. And I'll show you how nice flex works in CSS. I'm going to go ahead and put all this content in my div right there. I'm going to have to close that off and take that away. So it looks like this. Then I'm going to take this part where it says main content. And let me think about this. This is the minting button. I basically still want my minting button to be there. We also have the snack bar. The snack bar, I will kind of leave here at the bottom. So I'm going to leave that there. But this main content part, so I'm just going to select that all. And let me also put it here at the top. So let me put it there at the top. Now what we will have on the screen is basically something that looks like this. But now we want it to stack on top of each other. For it to stack on top, we need to here where it says display flex, we need to set the flex direction because it's by default in a row. So let's go set the flex direction to be column. And once we've done this, we can go back and we can see that Here's our top one. Well, the top one is actually pink, but there's nothing in it. And there's our bottom one. Let's go put something in that pink container. So this is the pink container, this div. And I want to grab this connect button. But I'm going to grab this as well. Or actually, let's just grab this. Let's cut this out. And let's put it in here. I can now see that this person is checking for this wallet. So I'm going to take this out and remove that as well. So we just have the minting button here at the bottom. I do, however, want to check if there is a connect, but this time I'm going to check it differently. How React works is basically if we now save this, we go to our app, we can see that it says connect, but we already connected. And that's why that wallet was there to check if this button is connected or not, and then it disappears. But I still want my connected button to be here on the right. I just wanted to say connected when we are connected. So how you can do that is we can take this out and put double curly braces, meaning that we are going to, well, there's single curly braces, but meaning that we are going to execute some logic. So what I want to do is I want to check for the wallet. If there is a wallet connected, it means that we are connected. So I can then say uh, connected. And if there's not, that's what this uh, colon does. We can say connect wallet. Now let me just change this to a capital as well. And when I save this, we can see that the text changes. We are now connected. So if we refresh, we can see connect wallet. If we click on it, it's going to ask us to connect to Phantom and it's going to say connected. This is a simple way of doing it. Let's go move it all the way to the right of the screen. Now, usually when we work with this much CSS, we put it in a separate file. For now, I'm just going to do this quickly because I will have a course where I explain to you in detail how to do beautiful CSS. Let's just quickly go and align this. So what we can do now, because this is displaying flex, we can kind of go and align this button all the way to the left. So this main container is displaying flex, but now we can display this one as flex as well. So we can say display this as flex too. This time I'm going to align the items while well, justify because it's now in a row. So justify the content to the flex end over there. When we do that, we can see that now the button is here on the right. I also want to give it some padding 
but I'm going to put the padding around the whole screen. So if we go back to our main div, we can just say this needs a padding and we're going to give it a padding of, let's say, 30 pixels. You have to put it in um, quotation marks like this, uh, pixels, or you can just specify 30. So if we go back now, you can see that there's our pink container, which we can see again, but it has now this display. Now, this blue div, I would really like it to kind of be to the bottom. But the first thing is we need to stretch this pink um, container to the bottom in order to style it properly. How we can do that is by giving this top style a height of 100 VH. So 100 VH means vertical height. When we do so, we can have a look and see that the pink is now all the way to the bottom of the screen. Now, this means that this pink section is now scrolling and that's due to the padding. So if you want to eliminate that being the case, then you should go back and change the padding. Instead of padding, call it a margin. I like using padding because it just feels much more natural to me than margin. So I can either do that padding or margin, or I can even put another container inside this container. But anyway, let's leave that up for the master CSS course. For now, we still need to kind of spread this blue all the way down as well. So what we can do is we can basically, because this is flex, right? We can give this bottom one a flex value. So we can say we need to specify this as flex one. When we do so, we can see that it indeed takes up all that space. Now, this is pretty cool, but I still have this issue where we have uh, <laughs> this block over here. So let me go and resolve that while the scrolling, scrolling bar. So I'm going to take the padding out there and I'm going to put another div over here. We're going to open the, open the div and maybe end it right at the bottom. So where it ends over here. Then I'm going to finish off the div there and inside this div, this is where I'm going to specify my style. This style is going to be a padding, uh, not a path, a padding of 30. So let's just do that. When we do this, you can see that it's now contained and we get this natural padding. Although we have this now, now we can see that this doesn't truly stretch to the bottom. And why is that? The reason why it doesn't stretch fully is because this is our main container now. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to grab this flex property so it can be flex, but also we need to flex itself to one so that it can take the full width of that screen. So if we go back now, we can see that it indeed does that, but then we're sitting with all this alignment issues again. So the only thing that we need to do is go back and also make this column. When we do that, we can most probably take out the display flex over here and just leave it like so. Um, let's just do this again. Let's go back. Let's not take out that one, but the column. And when we have this, there we go. So now we have a well-structured kind of uh, layout, right? We have the top header, it's there in the left-hand corner, but let's center this mint content. This is in the blue container. So if we go to the blue container over here, it's very simple. We can also say that need, this needs to um, justify the content to center and also align the items to be centered. When we go back to display our app, nothing happens. And the reason is we need to remember to put our display flex property. So when we have the display flex, we can now automatically see that it's in the center. So if we click um, connect wallet, phantom, there we can see there's all the data. But this looks a bit ugly. So let's go ahead and now look for where that content lives. And here it is. And I want to put this in its own div. The reason is, if I just leave it like this, it's going to take, it's going to think it needs to put it all in one row, which is not the case. So I'm going to put this back over there, just save it. And then because we have this container as displaying flex as well, 
I want to just say the flex direction so should be column and once we have that we can go back we can see there's all of our data again we can go one step further by rearranging some of this data for instance we probably want to know what the wallet is we are connected to but we don't need to know the balance it would be nice to know the total of nfts and also the ones remaining so let's go and restructure this so it makes a bit more sense i'm going to go back to visual studio and then the first thing i'm going to have a look at is removing or not removing this wallet but just copying that out removing the balance we don't care what balance we have because we do have the phantom wallet to check i'm going to go up to the top and then put in this wallet balance over here then because this is now the content is flex end i am going to change this to space uh, between so space between this will create a space between this wallet address and the actual connecting button because of this space between it's going to put a space between these two elements making the connect button be on the right and this wallet address on the left we also can now go down and let's just clean this up a bit i see that there's the amount redeemed and the remaining now we probably don't need the remaining and what we can do is maybe structure this a little bit better we can go ahead and maybe cut this out put it here and then put a forward slash between them this will be a kind of total available but let's make it the supply like so once we have this we should now have something on the screen looking like this i think that is pretty cool right so what we have now is your wallet on the left this on the right and the mint straight in the center what we can lastly do is just remove all these colors so we can go to the pink remove that one remove the green and remove this blue lastly go ahead and put a div between the wallet and the connect button when you save you'll see that your dap looks like this now where we can refresh and that your wallet connect button is on the right hand side if we click connect you can see that phantom will pop up we can connect to phantom and there's the supply one out of ten as well as our wallet address this is no way near to being extravagant but at least it gives you an idea how you can play around with css and html basically and then get to something like this i will create a master course so let me know if you want to see a css master course on how to make something look really really good but this is the basics and i really hope you guys enjoyed my tutorial if you did please share the word um, like subscribe and leave a comment and then till the next time i'll see you in the next video cheers for now